The material that I put together for the controversy between evolution theory and biblical creation is available to you in three different forms. You're looking at the first of a four-part series that I have uh, given the name of teaching videos. They total approximately three hours in length and they are available as you've already found under the teaching videos tab. They include also, in addition to these four videos, include downloadable uh, PowerPoint handouts, so-called, that you can download and print out to keep a record of the videos that are in this particular part of my presentations. I use the analogy of gasoline that we're all familiar with, purchasing gasoline, whether it be regular, plus, or premium. And this set of teaching videos I consider to be the regular type of information. Most of you should be able to, after viewing these four 45-minute uh, videos, understand the material that I'm trying to get across to you about evolution theory and biblical creation. If you do not feel that you have sufficient information from that, the next step up would be go to the plus uh, information, and that is under the videos tab on this website, which totals about four and a half hours worth of videos, and those videos, those 15 videos, go into this information in a bit more detail. You would need to sequentially look at these videos under the videos tab and get more information than you got on the teaching videos. The final level of information would what is what I would term premium, and that is the ebook. It is available on Amazon Kindle. You'd need to purchase it for three dollars and ninety nine cents, but uh, I think that very few people will need all of that sort of information contained in the ebook. You should get the information that you need to understand it and believe it in one of these first two choices. The ebook contains a lot of references, contains appendices, and contains a more wordy, perhaps, explanation of all these concepts. And I think only those who really want to evaluate, check, and, uh, and uh, determine for absolutely sure that they believe what I say would they consider buying and reading the ebook. In any event, you have these three levels of information, and what we're about here in this video is to look at the first video under the teaching videos. Now, these four teaching videos are divided into these four parts. We're looking at part one today, which is why evolution theory is not true, and concentrates just on the evolution theory side and demonstrate to you why it is not true. The second part will get into the biblical creation side of things and show you that it is true. So parts one and two will deal strictly with evolution theory and the second part dealing with biblical creation from the first chapter of Genesis, uh, the book of Genesis in the Bible. Parts three and four will go further into the Bible and address some of those phenomenon that are historical phenomenon that are reported within the Bible about Adam and Eve and Noah, for example, we'll find uh, a clock of when they existed. And in parts four, we'll look at the phenomenon of a thousand year lifetimes and the development of human races. I add parts three and four to give additional proof that there is a scientific backing for the historical account that we call uh, biblical creation. So let's move on to part one then, why evolution is not true. Now the reason why in this series of videotapes I'm covering both evolution theory and biblical creation is for you to give the basis, at least the scientific support that's available on each one of these two ideas. Uh, it turns out that there are some people who can believe both evolution theory and biblical creation at the same time and have no difficulty with this difference. However, I think most people end up uh, clinging to one or the other as their primary belief, if not their only belief. And there is a definite danger for someone who has started out believing the biblical creation story of uh, when they're exposed to evolution theory of losing that biblical faith. And this has happened over time, and here are two examples of where this has happened. Starting out with Charles Darwin, in his autobiography in 1876, which was published actually by his son, he made this statement. 
I had gradually come by this time to see that the Old Testament, from its manifestly false history of the world, with the Tower of Babel, the rainbow as a sign, etc., etc., and from its attributing to God the feelings of a revengeful tyrant, was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. Now it turns out that Charles Darwin started out in a believing family. His grandfather and his father were both Anglican ministers, Christian ministers, and he himself attained a, a divinity degree in his college experiences, such that he started out with a biblical faith. When he took his trip around the world and looked at uh, fossils and uh, life forms that he encountered in various parts of the world and developed his theory of evolution, this is what he ended up concluding that he basically says here that he lost his biblical faith and instead began to believe in evolution theory. Now this is not the only time it's happened of course and in fact most of the books that I've read on evolution the authors of these books express similar sorts of feelings where they cannot believe in biblical creation anymore even though they once did but now they believe strictly in evolution theory. And let's look at what Stanley Rice says in his book Life of Earth, written in 2011, some 150 years after Darwin's experience. And he says, As I learned about evolution, I had to give up on creationism. As I read the Bible and recognized its human authorship, I had to give up simple biblical faith. So there is that danger that one can lose that if you perceive that as a danger. And I'm really presenting both the scientific basis for evolution theory, which we'll, you'll see in this part is uh, basically false, that it is not a science, and then in the remaining three tapes, in particular in the second tape, I will show you that biblical creation history has strong scientific support. It is not something that be, should be disbelieved because it has no basis in fact. In any event, that's where we kind of start here, and let's go on to part one. Now this is a, a simplified listing of evolution theory containing the main points upon which evolution theory is based. And let's just look at these six uh, points. The first being that a single-celled uh, being called an animalcule appeared about three and a half billion years ago on Earth. It was the first living being, and that living being was responsible for all the rest of the beings that would follow it. All plants and animals descended from that original animalcule. You could think of the animalcule as being the original parent of all plants and animals. And there was a, over a long period of time, there was a sequential uh, evolving, uh, adapting, mutating from one plant or animal into a different plant or animal, usually in terms of increased complexity of the uh, future animal that has resulted from an adaptation or a mutation. So this happened over a long period of time and the evolution's path was completely unplanned. There was no plan and therefore no God or no supreme being that determined how this process would work starting out with the animalcule and resulting in uh, the current top of the evolutionary chain being human beings. So there was no plan to end up in human beings. It could as well have been some other form of a being, as well as all the intermediate beings could have been some other form. But whatever happened, happened, and that is evolution uh, that is going on, and it is believed that this evolution is still in progress. So it is still occurring. Well, that's a very long time span, so in our individual lifetimes we shouldn't see much in the way of evolution, but over millions or billions of years in the future, the idea of evolution theory is that this evolving would continue. Now, the way that a, a given species of plant or animal changes into a different species of plant or animal is through something called adaptation to environmental changes, and chance mutations of a being's characteristics. So the, we'll see later on when we look at DNA that a uh, mutation, a, a happenstance, a, a point change in some part of that DNA can result in different characteristics of the being. And if they also are adapting to different environmental changes, the net result of all that can be that we can end up as a new species according to evolution theory. And within that 
idea of changes and, and mutations and adaptations, uh, if those changes happen to be beneficial for the uh, creature, that becomes a positive thing, which is reinforced and leads ultimately to a new species, whereas if it's not beneficial, uh, it would, would that particular change would die out. This is known as the concept of the, the survival of the fittest or that the strongest survive. So those are the main points of evolutionary uh, theory, these six points in which uh, a theory has been developed. Now, uh, to understand that just in a picture, let's look at the next slide for what evolutionists call the tree of life. Uh, the tree of life is typically pictured in this form in which at the base of the tree is this single cell, whether it's bacteria or a plant. Right now it's believed it's pretty well as a plant. Uh, but this animalcule is the basis of it. And over time, early sea creatures appeared, fish, amphibians, then land lizards, birds, mammals, humans, and all the other uh, subtypes of species of plants and animals evolved over time as time proceeds here, ending up with humans being at the top of this evolutionary tree or evolutionary change. So that, that's the general idea of evolution, of things getting more and more complex with time without a defined plan uh, of the endpoints of these various changes to living beings. Now, in order for us to evaluate this theory from the point of view of a scientist, we need to look at uh, the scientific method, and we'll do that in the next couple of slides. So we're going to look at the scientific method, and then we're going to apply the scientific method to evolution theory in this part one video. Now the scientific method is something that has evolved over the centuries as an, a method whereby scientists can try to understand some phenomenon that they have observed, something that happens on earth or in space and wants to understand it, develop equations to quantify it so that one can, can uh, predict what's going to happen in the future in those conditions. Uh, it's been evolved over at least centuries, if not uh, millennia, over time as the various people who developed scientific principles used this method <clears throat> to validate what they were doing was really a coherent scientific area. It starts with the observation of a phenomenon. Something happens and we try to understand why it happens. Let's just take uh, something like when we drop a rock off the top of a building, it falls toward the earth. It's going to lead to the understanding of gravitation. But we observe that it falls. And so we do a number of tests. We drop it from different heights and drop slightly different materials, a small rock, a big rock, and observe that they fall, seem to fall uh, toward the earth at about the same pace. So we develop a theoretical explanation for how that happens. And then we compare it to this small quantity of data we've had from dropping it off of 10 different buildings from, or trees or whatever. And we think we understand and develop an equation for what rocks are going to do when they fall off of uh, high heights. We then make a, a prediction into the uh, future as to what would happen under other conditions. And we make, per, for example, we make a prediction that if we drop a very heavy object, it's going to fall faster. If we drop a very light object, it's going to fall a lot slower. We think that if we drop a, a big rock from the top of a building and we drop a very light feather of a bird, something that's light like a feather, they're going to drop at significantly different rates. So we do the test and we find, lo and behold, that the feather and the rock fall at about and reach the bottom at just about the same rate. There's a little bit of uh, turbulence associated with the feather as it goes a little longer distance by twirling in the, in the air, but basically it falls at the same rate. We take a similarly shaped material like to the rock that's substantially lower weight, and those two fall at the same thing. At that particular time, since we our predictions are, are not panned out, we, we made the prediction they should fall at different rates, and we find that they didn't, and then we go back and modify our theory until we reach the point where everything agrees. We go about this repeat of, of theory and tests and theory and tests until everything fits correctly. 
And at that point, we believe that we have developed a theory that is consistent with all the data that we have, and we continually make these predictions outside of it. But if we go a long enough time, it ultimately ends up in the fact that the theory has then become what we call a science. It not only correlates information, but it then can predict what's going to happen outside of the range that we have developed this theory. That is the definition of the scientific method, and that's how the scientific method can lead to a true area of technology that we today call a science. Now, the scientific method can, in a sense, fail, or in this case, it fails to end up in a science when all of this information cannot be reconciled together. And so, in other words, if you observe something that's happened, you develop a theory, you compare it to theory, and then all the time, predictions that you make are proved to be untrue. No matter how many times you go through these iterations, you constantly, constantly end up with a situation that is not uh, uh, consistent, then we don't call that a science, we call that a correlation. So if you have steps one through three all uh, working out and all the data that you can gather by hand for a given area of, of phenomenon is, is true, uh, but you can't st make steps four and five work, then the theory is known as a, as a uh, correlation, not a science. Let me give you an example of that where a, an area that potentially could be a scientific area ends up not being one. And that is the idea that children with the largest feet are the best spellers. Children with the largest feet are the best spellers. Now you can go through a, an elementary school, middle school, or even a high school, and you'll find in general that for all of those children, the best spellers are the ones with the largest feet. And so then, if we really believe that, I guess we'd go to some of the professional sports where the biggest athletes, the basketball and football and, and wrestling and sumo wrestling or whatever, the biggest people, and we check to see whether they're the best spellers on, on earth. And it quite likely, no disrespect intended, but quite likely they are not, uh, as a group, the best spellers amongst all the spellers on earth. And so there's some problem with our theory. And of course, if you think about this for just a few minutes, you realize it's not that children with the biggest feet are the best spellers. It's that the children with the biggest feet have been in, and it's not because of their feet size, in other words. The children with the biggest feet have been in school longer, have taken more English classes, have written more technical papers or more papers for the English classes. And as a result of having been in school longer, they are better spellers. It's their feet just grow the longer they get in school, but it's not related to that. So that's kind of a silly example of, of how the scientific method can fail and end up being a correlation, which might be useful, but does not have a cause and effect thing associated with it. The, the size of the foot has not determined the level of spelling. Now let's apply the scientific method that we just looked at to evolution theory. And here are the first four steps uh, in, uh, summarized in, first of all, what, we, what did Darwin observe or, and, and following evolutionists observed, that there's a similarity between uh, fossilized plants and animals as well as the living plants and animals that we see. And it seems like the oldest, at least of the fossils, seem to be the simplest. Some of the earliest plants and the seashells were very old, in, within very old rock, and uh, some of the later animals that were found, fossils of, uh, <coughs> of, uh, of animals that were on Earth uh, are some of the youngest fossils around. And also observing when looking at the fossils that some of these uh, uh, beings we don't see on Earth today, so they are extinct. So that was a general <coughs> observation of evolution theory and the theory that came to mind in Charles Darwin <coughs> was that all living beings descended from one another and only the fittest survives, and there were small steps between species. So that's the idea that we just looked at for the animalcule being the first being, and then all the rest of the beings over a very long length of time having evolved one from another. And as Charles Darwin traveled, and in subsequent years after Charles Darwin's time, there was a relatively small fossil record and a living plant and animal database that had been compiled by just a few people on Earth at the time. It seemed kind of consistent with this theory. 
oldest were, were simplest, uh, and some were extinct. And this seemed to be a, a theory that had reasonable possibility of being a scientific theory, a scientific area. Well, what predictions were made? Charles Darwin made two major predictions. And those predictions were, that first of all, since all of this evolution occurred in small steps over great expanses of time, one should discover some fossils of so-called missing link beings. In other words, as some uh, being, let's just say a fish, might have evolved into a lizard. If this happened, there should be some, some, uh, some animals that uh, were fossilized that lost their lives and ended up being a fossil uh, a third of the way in between, halfway in between, 90% of the way with, with some of the characteristics of a lizard but retaining some of the characteristics of a fish. <clears throat> and so there should be a whole bunch of these since there was a small steps over a long period of time. There should be a whole bunch of these missing link fossils between uh, every species of animal and, another, and uh, the one more complex above it and every plant and the one more complex above it. So there should be a whole bunch of these. And Darwin at the time thought that it was just a matter of, of a brief length of time when the geologists and the archeologists and paleontologists uh, got their act together and, and just found the right place to look for all of these missing link fossils. He thought that evolution theory was gonna be validated very quickly after his initial uh, books and and uh, discussions of the area when these uh, missing link fossils were found. He also predicted, and he was very worried in several chapters of his uh, seminal book on the origin of species, that there should be no very complex parts of beings found. Right, if you found a very complex part of a living being in a fossil, for example, uh, it, he was worried that how could that have developed slowly? If it developed very quickly, it would be of use, but if it developed slowly, you know, a third of the way or half of the way, and it had not, and it needed to be complete before it was useful, it would have died out. The, the being that started developing, say, part of an eye would uh, uh, not have uh, lived long enough, and its species would have, a subspecies would have not lived long enough in order for the eye to be uh, fully functional, so say that it could avoid predators or some such. So he was very worried about complex uh, parks being uh, found in these beings, and he wrote several chapters about it. Uh, and his time, the microscope was available, and he looked at living cells, in particular uh, animal cells, and what he thought was at the center of these cells was a little uh, dark colored blob of some jelly-like material. So I thought it was a pretty simple sort of thing. We'll see in a few uh, slides here that that is one of the complex uh, things that has been discovered, which, which basically uh, refutes this uh, second prediction that Darwin formed. So let's look at these predictions and see how they panned out and see whether evolution theory is going to be validated as a science by passing steps four and five in the uh, scientific method. Now in terms of missing links, uh, if they are found, one would have positive proof for evolution. And since the time of Darwin, or actually a few years before Darwin, in 1856, the first uh, possible uh, missing link was found. Uh, and we'll look, we'll look at, talk in a second about this series of missing links, potential missing links that were found and have, have all been uh, considered failures to date. Uh, now, there should be missing links between all plants or all species of plants and some simpler cousin or some uh, more complex uh, following plant and animal. And so there has been a, a uh, search over the last 150 plus years for missing links between a lot of different species and of animals, etc. But the biggest and most intense effort has been on the human missing link. To find something between, and current uh, evolutionary thought is between a human being and a chimpanzee. Find some uh, missing link, some intermediate beings in between those two uh, animals. And that if you found missing links and proved that they were missing links, say part chimpanzee and part human, that then you wouldn't have to bother to find all the rest of the missing links. Proving the human missing link side of things would, would make mute all the rest of the uh, uh, discussions uh, and searches for missing links between other animals and plants. But let's look at these. 
So Neanderthals were discovered in Germany, and a bunch of them have discovered it throughout Europe. And in, in recent years, uh, enough DNA of Neanderthals has been put together to get a DNA sample, and it's basically proven now that they are not human. Their DNA is not human. They are not uh, precursors, not the missing links for humans. Java man in Indonesia, uh, Piltdown man, which was a fraud, Peking man in 1923 in China was proven to be not human. Lucy, uh, and in my lifetime, I remember hearing the big uh, news about Lucy being found. She was about a three and a half foot tall uh, monkey looking type being, but lived in a community. And it was thought that she might, for a while, that she might be the uh, a missing link of a human, but it ultimately was found to be a monkey. Now, the one that, uh, the last one, the last big one that has been found was a, a being you've seen here in this picture, Darwinius Massillai. So Darwinius Massillai was discovered in 1983, and uh, at the time, Darwinius was thought to be the missing human link related to some of the pelvic structure of this being and the opposed thumbs that this being had. And so this was was. Uh, broadcast around the world in 1983. All of the major news outlets, the uh, uh, BBC, the New York Times, all the newspapers, all the television networks at the time, uh, broadcast many stories about the finding of this missing link, the final proof that evolution theory was true. The uh, discoverers of this being in Ethiopia, or in, I'm sorry, in uh, Germany, uh, the discoverers of this being uh, immediately wrote a technical paper. It was accepted in lightning speed. Usually it takes months to accept the technical paper, but it was accepted in a very short period of time. And it just happened that there was an international conference in this area at the time, uh, just right for this paper. And this paper was presented to the raves of those attending and to the raves of the world news media. Now it wasn't but uh, a few weeks to a month after that, that the entire thing was withdrawn. Closer look at this being uh, resulted in the, the, the fact that it was indeed a monkey. And everything was withdrawn. The paper, though it had been present, written, accepted, and presented, was withdrawn and basically said, sorry, uh, this was not the missing link. So this is the last missing link in 1983 that has been widely published as a missing link, and uh, I anticipate that in the future some will be found, but it's the track record's kind of looking like it will not be uh, found for humans, and uh, also there's been no success in all the other uh, missing links between other species of plants and animals. However, the fossil record that has been accumulated over time has some interesting aspects to it, and uh, it unfortunately gives evolution theory some problems. Now, what we're looking at here on the left-hand side is a graph, and it's a graph with time, years before present, so this is today at zero, and we're going back to about nearly four billion years to the time of that animalcule at about three and a half billion or so. And we, what we are looking at are dots here. It's, uh, it's over a thousand fossils and fossils are found when uh, a critter or a plant has died and has been encapsulated in some sand type material and then for some reason or another relatively preserved as this sand like material through an earthquake or a some other means is moved to a greater depth where it's under pressure, and this net result of all this is to, to form a, a specimen that we can get from a, a rock somewhere, and we can find that here is the remains of the skeleton, say, in case, some cases a little bit of the, the other parts of the creature encapsulated in rock. So these are over a thousand fossils representing the the range of fossils of the millions of fossils that have been found they come from some some books that try to cover the whole range and show just a few samples of of individual types of fossils uh, the whole bulk of these millions are just mostly replications of that same fossil type but anyway we're looking at a thousand of fossils here and the fossils are arranged by type 
So you can see on the bottom here we have, uh, let's look at these, algae and early land plants and mollusks and fish and birds and trees and modern man. And so they're, they're fossils of these various types of plants and animals. And an individual column uh, re reflects the same sort of a species. In this case, look at the algae column here. They're all algae, but they're found in different ages of rock. So geologists have um, measures for by various techniques of when, how old an individual rock is and when they find an encapsulated uh, animal or plant, a fossil within that rock, that's the age that's given to that fossil. So let's just concentrate again on, that, on this algae column here. And so here's a set of algae points and younger rock and younger rock. And you see that the oldest one here where the green arrow is pointing, the oldest algae appears at about 500 million years ago. And so the important point of this plot, the important points in these plots are really in a column anyway, are the oldest, the top, the oldest one in that column, which indicates to us today that that is the first algae that appeared on Earth. So that's why I've drawn these as columns and data points, and we'll look mainly at the tops of these columns and points. So let's look at a couple of aspects of this plot, which is, again, over these 1,000 points, representative of the bulk of the fossils that we know of today. And if we look at what we call here the Precambrian plants, these uh, series of, uh, I believe it's nine dots or nine locations on the Earth where some very, very old uh, fossils have been found. And over the late recent uh, three or four decades, there has been some uh, investigation and some controversy over just what these fossils represent. They're very tiny little things. And there is a hope among evolutionists, uh, paleontologists and evolutionary biologists, that some of these are animals. Why? Well, we're going to find that some animals appear uh, here at about 500 million years or so, and it would be very nice, and they appear, a whole bunch of them appear kind of in final form. It would certainly be nice to have some animal forms here that were slowly evolving instead of just appearing all at once. Uh, I think as of end of Dece December of 2011, the last paper that I saw kind of pretty well with using the latest investigated techniques uh, uh, has basically shown that all of these nine areas, all of these nine types of fossils are plants. So that all of the pre, so-called Precambrian, and that's we'll see in a minute what that means, all of these fossils are plants. So they were all plants up to about 500 million years ago. And that's not really too pleasing to someone who would like to see animals evolving over a very long time span and just all of a sudden appearing at about 500 million years ago. So that's a difficulty with evolutionary theory that needs to be explained. And perhaps there'll be some more discoveries of earlier fossils and some more a reanalysis of things, hopefully, according to evolutionists' ideas, to find some animals in these very rich things, but to date, only plants have been found. Now, in the next slide, let's look at this lower, at all of these points uh, uh, in this area here, you know, in a larger scale to see just what it's telling us. So here's, uh, again, the, the uh, versus time about, up to about 500 or 550 million years ago, looking at these same uh, individual points. And again, looking for the top of these, which determines the first of these to have appeared. And let's just see what it says. <clears throat> well, first of all, there were a whole bunch of plants and animals about 500 million years ago or so, plus or minus uh, maybe 20 or 30 or 50 million that appeared all at once. This is known uh, as the Cambrian explosion. This is a, a geologic uh, interval of time that is known as the Cambrian time. And all of these plants and animals kind of appeared all at once. And that is a problem for this slow and, and uh, deliberate process of evolution to have all of these plants and animals appear at once. So it's a negative for evolution theory. How could this have happened? Now evolutionists uh, in the recent times have come up with some explanations for this. Uh, there are two phenomena that have been documented in the published literature, that of adaptive radiation and punctuated equilibrium. They're slightly different concepts, but basically they say in evolution everything was going along slowly, slowly, slowly with small changes. And then all of a sudden a big change occurred. 
and all kinds of different species, say, radiated, or the equilibrium that had been gone all of a sudden was punctuated with a big non-equilibrium point, and all these species appeared. And then after that, everything went back to the way it was with slow and methodical change in species. Now that's, to my view as an engineer, that's kind of, and a scientist, that's kind of not too scientific to say, well, it happened and therefore we're saying it just happened for, for uh, no really explainable reason. Uh, that's just kind of trying to make the data fit what you observed without having a good technical reason for it. In the biblical side of the world, one would call such things that happened miracles. They're unexplained, but they result in a very big change. And so I don't count the adaptive radiation and punctuated equilibrium being of very good scientific merit to explain the Cambrian explosion. So the fossil record, as we've seen, has difficulties with evolution theory's main tenets. Now let's look at the second part of a uh, prediction that Darwin made, that there should be no complex organs. Uh, here is the first uh, major complex organ that was discovered, uh, or documented, I should say, and that is of the living cell. In particular, let's look at a living human cell and see just how extremely complex it is. It's not that little blob of dark jelly that Darwin thought when he looked through his microscope. It is indeed a very complex thing that just uh, boggles the mind that this could have developed very slowly over time and yet function in this exquisitely complex way that it does. So let's look at, first of all, uh, a cell. And incidentally, uh, I'm going to go over this very briefly and perhaps uh, you want to learn a lot more about this, and uh, this is the one part where I would suggest you go to the video tab and look at the cells video, which is a uh, uh, 15 or 20 minutes long, which just which explains this in more detail so that you can understand just what I'm talking about. But basically, it's extremely complex, and what happens is in, in each one of the 100 trillion cells in your body that are like this, food comes in from the bloodstream. It's processed by an area called mitochondria, and those mitochondria convert that food in the blood into what's needed inside of the nucleus of the cell. The nucleus of the cell is, uh, is so complex. So the cell, first of all, gets a message, and, and we'll look and start at the point here and go uh, counterclockwise around here and briefly explain to you what's going on here. But basically, within the nucleus, there are a number of manufacturing plants that make enzymes, which are the working molecules inside of the nucleus of these cells. And so let's start over here that you get a message from the brain that this cell is supposed to do something. So I've shown it here as a letter arrives at, the, at that cell. Uh, that's actually an electrical message that comes to that cell. And it's told, make an enzyme to do something. So a, it starts out inside of each one of these cells as a complete set of your DNA, and we'll see this in a later video. And that DNA contains in it the building plans to make the enzymes that are needed. So the, the, the plant that's going to make that first enzyme to do some job goes to the DNA, gets the, the plan blueprint for making that enzyme, and it makes the enzyme. Once the enzyme is made, a molecular transporter, a set of molecules that somehow know to transport this to the next plant within the cell. I've shown it here as a truck, but it's a molecular transporter. And it takes it to the quality control plant. And so this enzyme quality control plant checks to make sure that the correct enzyme has been made. They had to communicate also with the DNA to get the blueprint for what, what that enzyme is supposed to be like, but it checks to see whether it's made correctly. If not correctly, it goes back to the original plant that's uh, recycled, and the correct enzyme ultimately needs to be made. Well, that's not the end of the story. The next step is that another transporter takes that uh, correctly made enzyme to the folding plant. Now, the enzyme is a long uh, chain of uh, atoms, a molecular structure that's kind of like a linear chain, and it needs to be folded into a certain shape so that it can enter the final plant that we'll see in a minute, of the, in the right shape. The plant that it's going to go that needs this enzyme will have doors in it or holes or entry points in it that are a certain shape that are tailor-made to a particular enzyme that it's looking for. So that enzyme is folded. 
in the correct way. The folded enzyme then is taken by another molecular transporter, in this case I've shown it as a semi, to the quality control fold, the fold, folding quality control plant. Was that enzyme folded correctly so that it can be used by the appropriate plant that needs it? If it passes, it goes on by another transporter, and finally, at that point, that uh, enzyme that is made enters into the door that's made specifically to accept that enzyme when it's folded in a certain way, and the process is completed, that the cell does whatever it was directed to do. Uh, a very complex thing, and this, there's more multiple enzymes that are inside this nucleus all at the same time, along with, as we'll see, uh, 40 Six chromosomes are inside of this cell as well. There's a lot of activity and things. It's, it's like a manufacturing plant, but indeed very complex. And it is so complex that it could not have developed slowly with time, most people today believe. Now let's just take a slight uh, trip here to, uh, to, of interest to see what happens with pharmaceuticals. Now suppose you had some disease or some problem with certain part of your body, with certain cells of your body, the pharmaceutical company tries to come up with a medicine, with a pharmaceutical, with a molecule, group of molecules, that will some, do something within your cells. And so they spend a bunch of money, hundreds of millions of dollars, to develop the cell uh, solution of a, a molecule that will go into a certain set of cells and enter a certain door within one of the plants in that, uh, in that cell and do the corrective action that's needed. Uh, from what I talked about, about um, making an enzyme and folding an enzyme, just the correct way to go in a certain door, I think you can, can realize that the pharmaceutical company has a very tough job to make a new, en a new uh, pharmaceutical, a new enzyme, and make it folded in just such a way that it can get into one of the existing doors where it needs to go. Uh, also, if it's not folded exactly right, and which it almost never is going to be, it can enter potentially into the correct door, but it can also go into other cells and other doors. We know that is one of the explanations for this thing that we know for all of the medicines that we use, that they have side effects. The medicine goes to not only the correct place, hopefully most of the time, but it goes to places that can cause side effects. So anyway, that's just an interesting point, understanding the complexity of cells, which are considered by most to be a complex organ, which invalidates Darwin's idea that they should not exist. And there are quite a number of other ones of these that you can see if you listen to some of the, uh, the other videos in the video uh, tab. So what have we seen as a result of this look at uh, evolution theory from the point of view of the scientific method? we find that it ends up as, to this point, only a correlation. Only steps one through three have been completed. The predictions that were made are untrue, and the uh, final uh, result of all this is that there is no science here. Evolution theory is not yet, and doesn't look like it ever will be, a science unless it makes dramatic changes to account for not only the absence of missing links, but the presence of complex organs. Uh, I am trying here to only talk about evolution theory in this part one video, but I will give you a little bit of an inkling that these problems that evolution has with complex organs, with missing links, and with the uh, fossil record, the all early plants, no animals, and the explosion of all these animals. You're going to see in part two that all of this is resolved by biblical creation history when you look at the science that backs that history. So in any event, uh, evolution theory is not a science uh, as far as we've seen in this part one video. Now there is one area that anyone who's taken a biology course in, in recent decades anyway will have seen a picture of a, a number of creatures that lead up to a man. Uh, I did not uh, co-opt any of the ones that are out there in the uh, uh, literature. I just constructed my own, but you perhaps have seen one where you have eight or ten uh, monkey-like, uh, chimpanzee, gorilla-like beings lined up, and ultimately on the way on the right-hand side is modern man. 
trying to indicate that there is a by just by example here is a potential evolution of one form of living being into another. I've just constructed my own here, uh, starting out with a monkey. I guess that's a gorilla or an ape, and then ending up with man here uh, uh, walking with his briefcase. And so if you look at that structure, you could kind of give you an idea that, well, maybe this did happen. In fact, there are some sub-areas of the biological sciences and the evolution area, such as homology, comparative anatomy, and something called phylogenetics that attempt to look at these similarities in structure between various uh, series of <clears throat> living beings of similar type to try to demonstrate that this could be evolution. The difficulty with this is that this is really just circumstantial evidence. It's not proof. And I show that by the case that's made, for example, for these three automobiles, a Model T Ford, a, a 30s a coupe, and a, a, a very modern race car, Formula One race car here. There would be no one that would say that one evolved into another without some, some, uh, uh, someone actually making all these different cars. Uh, it's just the idea of using good design again. If a God chose to have monkeys uh, climb and walk and, and gorillas climb and walk, uh, he used the same general design with feet and fingers and legs and arms and necks that he has used in man, but it's just a replication of what we consider to be a good design on this uh, particular planet we live on called the Earth. So uh, this is not proof of evolution, it's just circumstantial evidence which just it really uh, does not make evolution theory into a science. So fine, let me just let me conclude that you've already seen, and I'll say it again, that evolution is not a science. It's only an empirical correlation, and I didn't state it before, but if you think about it a little bit, right now evolution is rather ironically faith-based. You can believe evolution or disbelieve it, but if you believe it, it's based upon faith, it's not based upon evidence. And that's kind of a, I say ironic because biblical creation is a faith-based uh, concept as well, uh, and it's maligned by evolutionists for being faith-based or belief-based. And I will, as I will show you in the next three parts of this uh, teaching video series, that in reality, that <clears throat> belief-based biblical creation actually has some strong scientific support. And uh, one of the things that I've gleaned as a result of reading all the evolution books and, and the biblical creation books is that evolutionists believe it not only because it seems reasonable but because they feel like they don't have any strong competition for explaining the life existence of life on earth and as I said what you will see in the next three parts is that biblical creation actually has some very strong evidence behind it it's not a science it's history but it has scientific support and I think that evolutionists can no longer rely on a scientifically weak opponent to bolster their own belief uh, that has, has long since passed away and so in terms of uh, evolution theory, what must be done is proof must be found. We're going to find missing links or need to explain complex uh, organs within a modified theory. And it doesn't seem like that is possible or plausible, and it doesn't seem like there is any effort in that direction to try to reconcile evolution theory with these difficulties. What we'll see in the next three parts will be the, why the history of biblical creation is true, and I'll show you examples of that. It turns out that six days of creation actually are six days of creation, but they happen to be upon the only clock capable of measuring time for the entire universe, so-called uh, cosmic clock, co cosmic background radiation clock. And then we'll delve into a couple of different areas where there are some other parts of the early part of the Bible in Genesis that may find you find unbelievable, such as Adam and Eve and Noah, thousand-year lifetimes and the development of human races. I'll show you scientific basis for all of these areas.